and in about 10, 15 seconds, something like that, will actually be on the air. All right. So now I don't, know, be... people, I don't know if people can hear me yet, but if so, okay. welcome. Well, we'll start in about. Uh... Ah, yes. Now I'm getting crazy feedback. I've got to undo the crazy feedback. Okay, we're still in the harmless banter phase yet. We're still in the harmless banter phase, right? I've got to oh, find where I'm. Yes, that's right. We're just harmless bantering. There we go. Okay, I've got it. Great. Right. And here we go. Welcome again to today's, this morning's, this afternoon's, this evening's, wherever you are, um, J Champions Conference. I'm Barry Bird. We're going to be talking today with Kai Horseman. Kai is um, going to tell us all about teaching, learning, Java 17 and beyond. And uh, please, 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 please feel free to post your questions in the chat. We'll be taking them more or less as we go along. The more questions, the better, because after all, that makes uh, Kai and I feel as if we're being useful here. Kai, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Kai Horstman. I uh, am the author, uh, most famously, of Core Java, which came out right with Java 1.0. I remember to this day uh, when my uh, then co-author, Gary Cornell, gave me a call in 1995. said, Kai, we're going to write a Java book. And I said, you don't know any Java, and neither do I. And he said, but I have a contract. So we learned it uh, over Christmas and wrote the first Java book. That was Java 1.0. Java 1.0 was a lot simpler than Java is today, so it was feasible then. And ever since, I've been teaching Java, and so uh, I thought it might be interesting for you to know uh, what I think about you know, how it should be thought, taught and how one can adapt the teaching to the latest features and which of the latest features are useful uh, for teaching a better course and all that. Um, if you're not a teacher but a learner, you might uh, just like to see uh, the flip side, you know, what teachers think about it. And that would also tell you what you might you know, want to learn. All right, so let's um, think a little bit about the audience that you might have, because they're different audiences. Um, you might teach beginning students, like in a uh, intro to computer science class at a college. Or you might be pressed into service in your kid's high school to teach like an afternoon enrichment course or a summer course or some such thing. So those would be ranked beginners. And the goal for a class like uh, that is that at the end of a semester, it would be really nice if they could code simple loops and methods. Um, that's really kind of all you can expect. And I could talk about that particular thing all day long because I also write textbooks for, for that audience. Um, Programming is very hard, and it takes uh, it takes some amount of time to be competent at the most basic things. Um, maybe you're teaching intermediate uh, students um, who are close to graduation, or maybe you're hiring those students and you're wondering uh, what it is that they're learning. And so there the goal is that they should be able to join a professional team when they graduate. And, uh, be uh, reasonably useful. Uh, they can't know everything, of course, but you know, they, sh they should be able to hit the ground more or less run. Um, maybe you're teaching competent programmers in another programming language. Maybe that there's a uh, training course at your company, or maybe you're organizing such a course and you're kind of wondering you know, what should be going on in it and uh, what the syllabus should be. Or maybe it's a conference presentation um, that, again, is directed to, to others. And you know, that, uh, that situation, you know that they're professional programmers, they can code, they, they can design, and so they want to be able to transfer their skills in whatever the language they are fluent in into Java and learn those things that Java has that maybe where they came from uh, didn't get have. Um, maybe, um, and this is always a sad story, maybe you need to uh, maybe you need yourself study for a certification exam or you need to train people who do, or maybe you wonder whether you should put any stock into the results of such certification exams and kind of want to know what goes on there. And of course, with certification exams, there's only a single goal, namely to pass the exam. Uh, whether that is correlated with being able to program or being able to design, you know, that's anyone's guess. Um, uh, the skills that are needed to pass a certification exam are certainly quite different than those of being able to uh, program in Java. 
So um, I will at various times say something about different kinds of audiences. And um, I just wanted to prime your mind that uh, whatever I say it is, has to be understood in the context of whatever particular audience. Um, <clears throat> just in case that anyone's wondering about, about the picture on the right hand side, um, you may have seen this many years ago when the MOOC craze first came. Um, the uh, instructor of the first MOOC course gave presentations about you know, what, uh, how he was teaching 100,000 students online. And he said, you know, the teaching hasn't really changed very much over hundreds of years. There's the person in the know, that's the one up here and, uh, in the yellow outline, teaching a bunch of people who are uh, paying attention, except for the fellow here in the other yellow outline who is fast asleep. So indeed, it hasn't much changed. All right, so there's a few challenges that you have to pay attention to when, when you teach. Uh, particularly for beginners, there's a phenomenon called cognitive load. So when you overload the, the mind of a beginner with too many facts, they really slow down. And it's to the point they have to learn a lot of stuff. They have to know the syntax. They have to know it's four and then a uh, parenthesis and then three things separated by semicolons and another parenthesis and an opening brace and all of that. That's a fact that you and I, our fingers do it automatically, but for them, it's something they have to do. Variable definitions, types, semicolons, all of that stuff um, can easily overload a beginning learner. And it's very important to do what one can, particularly in a language as complex as Java is today, to lessen that cognitive load to every degree imaginable. Um, there simply are not that many facts that a beginner can have in their mind at the same time. Um, and <clears throat> I'll talk about some strategies for that. Um, another challenge, and that's really true for learners of uh, uh, at any level, is that most of the time, um, the people who you teach, they will use what you teach them. So if you teach them something that uh, you just want them to know as some kind of an auxiliary piece of background information, that often does not come across. Um, if you teach them something, they're likely to use it. And I will give some examples when I think that one should definitely cut down on teaching some of the things um, because of that. And the other thing is the order in which you teach greatly influences the order in which people do something. There's been a big debate uh, whether one should teach objects early in a CS1 course or whether one should just teach first functional decomposition and static methods and then teach objects later. And there's no question that if you do the latter, people will first do functional decomposition and static methods before they do objects. Um, of course, over time, that corrects itself, so it's not a fatal thing, and it, uh, it may well be a sensible teaching strategy to lessen the cognitive load, but it's something that you need to, to pay attention to. All right, also, when you learn something, um, you might want to flip this around and say, you know, just because someone tells you something doesn't mean that you should use it, and also just because someone tells you A before B doesn't mean that A is actually more important, so you always want to question these things. All right, so let me just start with something simple. Um, and you'll see in a minute where this is heading. Now think about you want to teach someone classes who has not done much programming before, or maybe who has never used classes before and has done, say, a, a course in Python with functions and loops and arrays. So um, there is a lot of stuff to teach there, right? So you, classes have behavior. So you want to teach methods and the parameters and the, the, the this argument. That's kind of non-negotiable. You have to understand these things to know anything about how classes work. Um, you have to teach state instance variables. You know, that's the other aspect of a class. A class has behavior and it has state. Um, do you need to teach mutable state? Um, maybe not. If you just want to get at the very basics of classes, mutable state is, uh, not all classes have mutable state. Um, and you know, maybe it's best if people start out with immutable classes. What about identity? Well, in the olden days, um, and still in Java 17 today, you know, of course, every object has identity, um, but that will not be true much longer. With Valhalla, we'll get classes where the instances do not have identity. Um, so maybe that's not something that, that's that important anymore. Encapsulation, um, you know, people who teach learn classes in Python or in JavaScript, they don't know anything but encapsulation, and they still get the basic idea of object-oriented programming. Then again, maybe encapsulation is pretty important, something to think about. Um, so those are the, the essential complexities of classes. And then you have a bunch of incidental uh, complexity aspects in Java. 
there's overloading. You can overload constructors, you can overload methods. Um, and there are complex rules that probably, you know, if you forced me to recite how overloading resolution works in all detail, I would probably flounder quite a bit. Um, calling constructors some constructors. There's some, some rules for that and it's complex. Initialization blocks. I happen to know this because I had to write it up for, for core Java, but uh, I don't use most of it. There's static. We all know static. There's nested classes. Also a ton of incidental complexity. And I think we can all agree that is something that one does not need to teach right away. Um, that can come later or maybe never. And uh, when I say never, the exact core details of overloading is something that probably most people don't know. I mean, we know probably a good 50% of those rules. So the classic class that, you know, here's baby's first class or one example of that. Here we have a clock class. It has an, uh, and it just has a 24 hour clock. So we have the minute since midnight, we have a constructor, we have uh, getters for the hours and minutes. Um, and just to make it a little bit more interesting, they don't just return this instance variable, but they actually do a little bit with it. We have a mutator that advances this by a certain number of minutes, and you never mind the math here. And we finally have a true string so that people can do something with it. Fantastic first class. It's minimal. There's you know, at the absolute minimum in there that you need to show, in this case, mutable state and encapsulation. Um, but now we could question this. Do we really want to start out with mutable state? You know, maybe we should have, instead of having a clock, we should have a point in time uh, where it can't be mutated. Do we want to start out with encapsulation? Um, maybe all this public and private stuff is already too much in terms of cognitive load. So um, let's look at how you would do this thoroughly modern. Here's the thoroughly modern version of this very first example. We wouldn't be using a class. We would be using a record. Right? A record has methods. Here we have a perfectly beautiful method. The advanced method um, gives us a new time that is so many minutes away. You know, there's a bit of complex math here, um, but it's a method. It doesn't get any more minimal than this. You have the state given here in the constructor parameters. You automatically get getters for the state and you get a true string method. No mutable state. I think that's pretty good because when we first all learned uh, object-oriented programming years and years ago, um, mutable state was kind of the norm. And now more and more one says, you know, a lot of classes shouldn't be having mutable state. And so why not start with one that doesn't? Um, the trouble is you know, many of them are boring, but this one is kind of actually has a bit of an interesting action. Um, cognitive load, it doesn't get much better than that. A single method and two instance variables. Two string for free, you know, what's not to like. Um, it's not that students ever loved writing two string and they didn't really learn a lot from doing it. Um, so should one do this? Should one start out a CS1 course with records instead of classes? I think it's a potentially good idea. I know of at least one other uh, Java champion, uh, Remy Forax, who was doing that in his introductory course. And uh, it makes logical sense. Um, encapsulation could come later. Um, and mutable state could come maybe much later. Um, the only pr problem I have with it, and I could get over that problem, is that um, because of the syntax of Java, there's not necessarily a very smooth path from this syntax to the general class syntax that I guess I would like students in a course to master as well. They now have to learn, you know, what pretty much is, well, maybe another extra half of syntax, right? Because uh, you have class instead of record. Okay, they, they can deal with that. Um, but then the instance variables clearly are different. Um, the, the knowledge of the methods carries right over. So maybe that is a small objection and uh, uh, not a super important one. Um, the point I want to make is, is that if uh, with new features come potentially new ways of teaching. And so you could think of you know, maybe records are should be the entry point into OO because you learn methods. Methods are the most important part, namely behavior. All right, that's just there as food for thought. And maybe if you have questions or comments, we can talk more about it uh, later. Um, another example on um, just teaching the basics is, what do you teach first, interfaces or inheritance? What did you learn first? 
interfaces or inheritance. So I've picked a random book, um, that's in the interest of modesty, not mine. Here's uh, yeah, the delightful Java programming language um, in its fourth edition. And um, chapter three is extending classes. Chapter four is interfaces. So clearly inheritance was taught before interfaces. Um, and in core Java, it's the same thing. Um, like, because we've always done it like that. But is that good? Is that right? Inheritance is pretty complex. You know, you have to, to teach uh, the learner there is a single superclass um, and you know, why there's not more than one possible. Um, then superclass construction is, uh, is not trivial. Um, overriding a method with super dot is not easy. So there is a lot of mechanics involved um, with inheritance that with interfaces, of course, you don't have. Um, and also, how often do you really use inheritance? Um, these days, you know, it's not that I never use it, but um, we all here favor comp composition over inheritance. So maybe we should actually teach composition over inheritance and not first teach that you know, what used to be the shiny new feature, uh, which is no longer shiny or new, um, as uh, something super momentous. It is something that has its place, but it's not the solution for everything. What we really care about is not inheritance. What we care about is polymorphism. We greatly care about the fact that when you have a reference to an object and then now you invoke a method on it, that you don't know what that method actually is. That's what you get with interfaces. So um, you should teach interfaces first. I strongly believe that. Why don't I rewrite core Java? Because when I do that, I get angry email from uh, thousands of instructors. I don't know, thousands, but some dozens of instructors who say, hey, I'm going to drop your book because you must teach inheritance first. We've always done it like that. So there's a lot of um, <clears throat> uh, 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 habit in this. People learned it like that themselves. They are more likely than not to teach it like that. Like I said, whatever you learn first is what you think is the most important. Um, but this is something that I think sh should definitely be done the other way around. You should teach interfaces first. And in fact, to teach interfaces like there were in Java 1.0, um, they're pure and simple, zero cognitive load. You get to polymorphism right away. There's actually interesting examples that you can get in the standard library. And that way you have polymorphism out of the way. And then later you can go to inheritance with all of its complexities. All right. So Kai, now, we have a couple uh, of questions. That yes, go for up. it. Um, one, uh, let's see. Uh, I like the modern approach, but when students go out into the real world, they rather find classical mutable state encapsulation. Couldn't that be confusing? Um, well, there's a big uh, difference between uh, this what they learn in CS1 and going out out in the world. There's you know, several years between that, and of course, they're going to be seeing mutable state. Um, the question is, how do you start? Um, so no one says that they have to know mutable uh, state. I mean, it's that clearly they need to. Um, and so from a teaching perspective, one tries to come up with a pathway through the language that gets them uh, one step at a time, where at each time the cognitive load is not too much. And so what, what Remy has been saying, and uh, I think it's definitely worth thinking about, is you know, shouldn't one start with the simplest thing first? Um, over time, maybe we'll be writing many more records. Who knows? And, and related to that, records are the last thing that um, I, the writer of the yeah. comment, would teach. Records are the last thing that I'd teach. We build up the reason for wanting records. What about that argument? Um, that is yeah. possibly true, but it's always very tricky to teach something bad first and then say that's not actually what we want because half the audience doesn't get it. I'll come back to that point when I talk about synchronized and, uh, and threads later. So I, I understand it, um, but th th there's a danger there. Doesn't mean that, I'm not going on the record here, no pun intended, saying you must teach records first. I th just say, yeah, give it a thought. And there are many good arguments why, you know, that is maybe too thoroughly modern, um, but I think it's interesting to think about. Okay. All right, so in the same spirit, um, you know, now ever since Java 8, we have optional and, you know, everyone loves to hate on no. Um, that license plate, by the way, um, some, uh, some coder in California actually had a license plate name, uh, uh, 
this uh, a special plate that he paid 50 bucks for um, with no, and he ended up racking up a, a bunch of traffic tickets because of some data systems that when they couldn't find a match, they would print out no. Um, so whatever you do, don't use null for your license plate. Um, it's an expensive vanity license plate. So could we get beginners to not use null? Do they really need null? Of course, I'm not saying never teach null. I'm saying um, in the very beginning course, can you somehow do without null? So let's do this thought experiment. What do you need null for? To uh, indicate the absence of something? Well, that's these days we say that's actually bad practice, right? You should really use an optional for that. So maybe not teach them a bad practice. Um, well, you kind of need null for linked data structures, right? It's hard to do that without null, or is it? Um, you know, you could have a node in a linked list and say it carries some data, and then it has a next. That is a reference to a node, but it's an optional. So let's see how far we would get um, uh, our uh, first semester or maybe second semester students, since it's in data structures, to, to fly with this. Well, of course, you only want to use optional um, if you use it right. So if you use optional and you call the is empty method and only if empty, is, if is empty returns false, then you call the get method to get what's inside the optional. That's no good. That's really no better than checking whether something is null. Um, the only thing is you get a different exception. Um, so you, optional was designed to do it right. So, and it does require a certain technical expertise to do this. So let's say I now have a linked list and I'm not separating my linked list and my node class here for laziness. So uh, just my, my header node is, is the first element in the linked list. And so I'm having one of these, or it might be empty, right? In, in which case, head just would be optional.empty. And now I wanna sum up all of these data things in here. Um, how do you do that? Um, well, you, I don't wanna call is empty. I don't wanna call get. And so the easiest way I could think of that is to actually do it like this, um, to call map, um, then call the function that now recursively you know, computes the sum of the tail and adds to it the data field. Um, and the map will never get executed if the thing is not empty. Uh, sorry, if it is empty. Um, and then do an or else. And then I get a zero here. And so that will work. Um, I'll either get the sum or I'll get zero, but it doesn't look like something that um, our budding programmer in a CS2 course would necessarily get to. One can teach these idioms um, and that might be an option. I think it would get better in the not too distant future. I mean, even though, well, you can't quite do this. Eventually we're gonna get some kind of pattern matching where you can say something like, you know, if, um, if that uh, the next element or actually, right, it just had, if, if the head has a tail, then you can use it and otherwise if it's empty. The syntax here is not the real syntax. There's gonna be a syntax for deconstruction of these optionals um, that will in Java 19 or 20 or uh, sometime beyond that um, will come. And it, I've seen various proposals for it. So I've just put one here that because it's easy to understand, not because I think that's the one that we're actually gonna be getting. Um, but if you have uh, such a deconstruction like you have in Scala today, then you know, maybe teaching without null would actually be, become quite reasonable. Um, in the same uh, spirit, Java 8 gave us streams. Should we teach beginners about streams right away? Again, I'm not saying you should never teach streams, but should you accelerate the teaching of streams? Should that kind of become your normal case? And I think there's a case to be made for that. Because when I teach beginners, I teach them explicitly about 10 loop patterns. Um, again, remember cognitive load, um, a beginner will at this point know how a for loop works, how a while loop works, but if you ask them to do something with it, um, they are often completely at sea because they don't yet think of the building blocks that you and I are thinking. So one thing that's uh, to every programmer is completely clear. How do you count a bunch of matches? You have a collection and now you want to count all of the ones that match some condition. You iterate over the collection. If it's a match, then you increment a counter. Um, if you teach this pattern explicitly, that's pretty good because then students can kind of mentally go down the catalog of patterns and then say, yeah, I, I know how to do this. And then they, they can recreate it. If you don't give the pattern a name, if you just rely on the fact that they somehow intuitively know it, they often just flounder because they have uh, an infinite number of choices. Um, the least favorite pattern that my students have is finding the first match. 
because finding the first match is kind of icky. You have to have a Boolean, and then if uh, this loop here can exit in the middle, and uh, so they know that this every time they have to do that, then uh, they have to pay a little bit of attention. But even that is good. That way they have the pattern, and they they can put it to work. Having written down that pattern once, then with with an initiation uh, for uh, maybe reading from a file, and then another one where they read from a list, um, that really uh, uh, helps them out a lot. Um, well, it would help them even more if I just told them how to do it with streams, right? Turn the thing into a stream and then use filter and count of filter and find first. Um, and so I've often been tempted to do that and I've been held back by the fact that streams are yet another thing. Um, but it sounds like something one should at some, uh, at some point get at, particular, you know, we should get students to be more thinking more functional and this is functional, right? We say the property, the fact that the property, they can simply get by putting a different Lambda expression here. Whereas in the more explicit loops, they have to go somewhere in the inside of the loop and replace the pseudo code with some handcrafted condition. You know, the, the Lambda expression seems, seems better. The only reason that's been holding me back is that um, this works great for a certain class of algorithms, but of course, minor changes then make it really hard. Like what if you want to find the index of the match? Then you know, uh, filter and find first don't help you at all. I mean, you can do it if you zip together with the indexes, not so easy in Java. Um, then uh, uh, that would be better. So I th yeah, maybe if Java had a zip with index, um, I would be more enthusiastic about doing this. But I think this is something where one really can innovate. Um, and uh, it's, uh, I think where we will see people uh, move on. Um, so it, it used to be that streams is kind of considered like a very advanced topic. But I think streams has a chance of you know, move, moving uh, further to the, to the beginning because it really could help students conceptually. Um, another thing, um, that should one use var? Um, so should I say var builder equals new string builder instead of saying string builder builder equals new string builder? Um, so Stuart Marks has a very nice style guide for that, um, that if you're not currently using var, um, you should have a look at. Um, and that style guide is, of course, for professional programmers. Um, here's one of the rules in there. Consider var when the initializer provides sufficient information to the reader. And so here's Stuart's example, pass that off. And then, of course, we know this thing is going to be a path. Um, well, for someone who's just learning out Java, uh, who hasn't seen a lot of it, that may not be so obvious, right? How do you know it's a path? Because we know that whenever you have class name dot off, by convention, there's an overwhelming chance that this is a factory method of this class or interface that produces an instance of that class or interface. Um, there's no rule in the Java language that says that. And there's, of course, any number of exceptions. So for a learner, um, that might not be so good. So what I have done, actually, in my, in my textbooks now is I have said, I'm going to use var whenever it's blindingly obvious what the type of the right-hand side is. And when is it blindingly obvious? It is blindingly obvious when the thing on the right is new and then the name of a class. A new string builder is a string builder. Every student knows that. And so at this point, there's no value added by saying string builder builder equals new string builder. And so one can safely use var. Um, and in fact, with an array list, it's kind of nicer, right? Because we say new array list of string, and that's an array list of string. Because if you were to say array list of string words equals new array list, then there's the temptation to get into the diamond operator. And does the diamond operator really add any value? Uh, nowadays, you know, var seems to ticket. So uh, that's my recommendation to teach them var. Except there's one case when I, when I don't use var, and that is in uh, that chapter in the book or in my, in my lessons when I teach polymorphisms, right? When I say employee Fred equals new manager, I want to make the point that I can put a manager into an employee and then var is not useful. But otherwise, I think the time for var has come even for, for early learners. Um, another reason that people use var is for types that you'd rather not mention, right? So here I'm iterating over these uh, uh, entry set of a map. 
And I can never remember. Is it a map, angle bracket, string, string dot entry? What the, what's the type of this thing? So I use var. But of course, for students, um, you know, maybe you don't care, and then you want to use that. But you know, actually, the type of this particular thing is map dot entry of object object. Do you want your students to? This is because uh, it's a properties. So it's not uh, a general map. Um, do you want students to know this? If not, you know, var is is your friend. Do you want the students to understand this? Like the fact that an you know, entry is a static inner class of map, then maybe you don't want to use var. So I like my rule of saying when it's blindly obvious, use it. And otherwise, probably not. Um, that's for beginning students. For professional programmers, student Stuart Marx's rules have you covered. All right. Um, another brand new feature: pattern matching with instance of. So, so Kai, we I can just wanted to interrupt with a question yeah, about absolutely. var. Um, do you have any um, trouble with students who are tempted to use var in fields? Um, uh, absolutely, and they'll learn quickly, right? Um, I'm not too bothered by that. Um, if, if it's a feature where the compiler tells them right away you can't do it, um, I, I don't think that's a problem. Just don't test it in, a, in an exam. Um, yeah, so this, this gets me uh, to, to my uh, pet peeve about certification exams. So certification exams are full with questions like that. You know, what is wrong with this code? And then they'll show var as a field. And that doesn't really test any, any useful knowledge. I mean, the... Uh, if, if they were to say, and the compiler shows this error message, then it wouldn't be worth asking anymore. But that's the situation in which you're always faced with in practice. So I don't think that students have trouble uh, with that. Then Ex Exams are tricky things, no matter what the setting. Well, exams are, are a tricky thing, and that's often because the exams don't try to find out what the students know, but they try to find out what the students know in 45 minutes. And that's you know al almost always bad. Here, in, right now, I'm teaching in Germany, where it's even worse. Where the exams are given by a Prüfungsamt, by a separate department, uh, that's very inflexible. And so, when I say that the students need to be, have access to to their laptop during the exam, they they don't know what to do with that. And so, I say, fine, we can print out the Java API docs, and then they usually relent. But um, yeah, um, so exams are tricky. There we are. Uh, all right, pattern matching with instance of. So we can now say, if Fred instance of manager M, so that binds M to Fred when the instance of test succeeds as a type of manager, and then we can call a manager method. So here's, let, let's say that set bonus is a method that only works for managers and not for employees. Um, that's, my, that's the example in core Java. Um, and so that's a super pleasant syntax. It's an easy win over saying, uh, using the cast. So should you teach that? Absolutely. That should be the normal case from now on. That way, uh, you know, the, the casts are always icky, um, and there's no need for the students to, uh, uh, to to use the new form. Should they be able to understand the old form? Sure, if they see it somewhere, and they'll see it in plenty of code. That's no question about that. But in terms of, the, of what you want to teach them first, so that that's the, what they consider the, the new normal, that should be... Uh, <clears throat> the much nicer syntax that we have. Or maybe um, you find that uh, pattern matching is the ticket, and it will be you know, going forward more and more the ticket. Um, you might instead use the switch form, where you say, if it's an executive, do this. If it's a manager, do this, or otherwise do this. You can do this today. This is in preview in Java 17, um, and it works just fine. Uh, and the instance of and the switch are two uh, sides of the same coin. Really. Um, so this is useful for uh, algebraic types. Um, if you want to say that that a list is really a, uh, a, a sealed type with two uh, subclasses, non-empty and empty, then and it looks super elegant. In this case, you don't have to worry about the default because Java will uh, see that because uh, with the sealed type, You've list, listed all the possibilities, and you're done. So um, I think that's something that would become attractive. And as one teaches a more, you know, maybe a bit more functional curriculum, um, that's something worth considering. Um, so let me actually say a little bit about pattern matching um, before one gets too uh, excited about it. Um, 
So pattern matching is coming. Um, we already have um, the, the, these instance of patterns and many more will appear. Patterns can always appear in a switch or in an instance of. Um, so in a switch, you would have multiple cases and there would be a pattern following each case. With an instance of, you would have a single pattern and it follows the instance of. Um, so uh, going back to this slide one more time, here you see the instance of pattern and here you see the exact same pattern in a, uh, in, in a switch. All right. Um, the type patterns exist today in preview in Java 17. Um, these guarded patterns, um, I don't know if they exist today or they will exist in Java 18. Um, I think that they come in Java 18. So you can say that um, you're going to match a manager under the condition that whatever comes to the right-hand side of the ampersand. You can put that pattern to the right-hand side of an instance of or inside a case of a switch you know, once, once this becomes an official feature. Um, you can match records. And so you can say something is a case rectangle and um, then it's a rectangle. And then you can reference the internal structure. If, a rec uh, if, if this is a record that is constructed out of a point and two, uh, two integers and the point itself, um, oops, I forgot uh, ints in here. It has to say int x and int y here. Um, then um, you can afterwards refer to the four variables, x, y, width, and height that are being uh, matched against this pattern. Um, you can do the same thing to match with an array. You can say, I want, uh, I want a case to match an array. And then you can bind first and second to the two initial elements. And then the dot, dot, dot means that the rest remains unmatched. Um, with all of these patterns, um, the switch has uh, a few features. One of them is called dominance checking, where you get an error if you uh, have the cases in the wrong order. If uh, in this case here, where, uh, 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 oops, oops. Uh, <laughs> this is not an error this way. I, um, I, I needed to switch them. Uh, sorry about that. So if you put this one here before and then the case integer i afterwards, then the case integer i would have been in the error because it, it can never be reached. So sorry about this one here. Um, I need to uh, fi fix those slides. So if you first put the case number and then the case integer, then the integer can't be reached and you'll get an error. Then for seal types, there's coverage checking. We already talked about that. So switch is going to get all of these superpowers. And further on, they'll be the deconstructors that are already alluded to. There's a thinking of whether you should have and or of patterns. You know, right now we can do ands, but you know, um, can, can you put more, uh, more than one in here? And so they're, uh, they're, they're busy designing all of these things. Um, and you've seen, of course, these kinds of features in other programming languages. So um, the problem with it is there is a lot of incidental complexity that may hold you back from using some of these uh, during teaching. Um, for historical reasons, instance of um, is null friendly. If you match against a null, um, it's, it's just uh, false. If a switch is null hostile, when it gets a null, it throws an exception. And so in order to smooth that over, nowadays you can, uh, you can add a case null to a switch, or you will soon, and then th that changes the, the way that switch worked. Um, so it's, uh, it's just complexity that uh, if you never use null, you don't worry about it. Um, so may maybe you don't particularly want to dwell on that when teaching this. There's, again, for historical reasons, subtle difference between the syntax. Um, in uh, th this one here is one of these new nifty guarded patterns. Um, the second one here has nothing to do with guarded patterns, but instead you have here a Boolean condition, and then afterwards you have another Boolean. So the, the and here is a guard, and the and here is, is a Boolean and. Fortunately, they mean this, the same thing now, but it's, uh, it could get problems when you later have, have other uh, patterns. Um, you know, the dominance and coverage checking doesn't work with the guards very well because how could it evaluate the guards at compile time? All right, so um, just beware of that, that before you embrace these too enthusiastically, 
um, that you'd have to either sweep these under the rug, you know, which is probably the right thing to do in a beginning course. Um, but uh, yeah, at some point, people will have to uh, to know about some of them. Um, anyway, patterns are coming, and so prepare for that and think yeah you know, how they might benefit um, the subset of Java that you want to teach. Um, someone asked me this question, and I thought this was a uh, interesting thing to think about. Now, maybe we should actually be much more relentlessly functional when teaching the first course. Don't teach classes. You know, do your typical functional programming, like you know, in that classic book, um, The Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. And so in functional programs, you, know, you would use map and filter and things. So you know, let's just start. We would implement map for the students. But you know, here, map takes an array, and it takes a function, and it produces another array. And unfortunately, because you have static typing, you'd have to get, use generics. But it's not even going to work because this is not enough information to construct the result. You can't instantiate a generic array. And that's now a morass that I don't think one wants students to get into. So maybe you can use lists. And that does work. You can instantiate a generic list. And so, yes, you can do this. Um, when you call the function f, you have to know that um, when you have a function, that the magic method to apply the function is called apply. But when you do it with filter, where you see the same code here, you have to know that the magic uh, method for filter, uh, for, for predicate, is test. Um, I don't know why they did it like that, but that's what we had in Java 8. So that's yeah, a little bit of a, uh, of a word here. Um, so you could probably just stick with function t boolean instead of uh, predicates, and uh, then that would work. The lambdas, of course, don't, uh, don't care. And then you could write things you know, with enough static imports. You could write filter of map, and here you'd have your, your lambda expressions, and it's functional. Um, you could probably make, make uh, this work. Um, it would have you know, quite a bit of sharp edges, and I'm not sure if you weren't better off doing it in Scheme. Um, and so the, the two kinds of sharp edges that you get are the, the fact that the, uh, the generic typing in Java, particularly with uh, the, the complete lack of type inference there, um, makes it pretty verbose, um, as you can see here. And uh, the second thing is this, this baggage that you get from the past, the fact that you can't instantiate generic arrays, that you have these uh, oddball and uh, ad hoc types for the most common functions, the fact that there is no actual function type, but you need to have a separate interface for each of them. So um, you know, that might be something for, for an honors course or something, but I don't think uh, the general public is going to be ready for this. So <clears throat> no talk of me would be complete without saying something nasty about Switch. So as you may know, we now have four, in words, four different versions of the switch statement. I will uh, not go over them in detail, but you can admire these. Um, so this is since J Java 14, I believe. Um, and so there are two axes. There's a statement and expression axis. So here we have statements and expressions. And then there's a fall through and no fall through. And all the four combinations of this are possible in, uh, now in Java. Uh, you can tell the difference that the, the ones that are uh, fall through, they have the colon behind the cases. And the ones that have no fall through have arrows behind the cases. And the expression, of course, each of the branches just has a value, whereas in the statement, each of the branches has a statement. Um, and also, um, the, uh, the, the, the expression form has to be in expression position here, like on the right-hand side of an assignment, for example, or it could be passed to a method. Um, so all these four combinations exist. Um, and this was specifically done for teachability, um, to say, you know, there's these two axes, and uh, every programmer already knows this one kind of switch, now propagating it along these two axes of statement versus expression and fall through versus no fall through should get them to all the combinations that they ever need. 
Well, actually, when I uh, presented this uh, some time ago um, to a bunch of other Java champions, they didn't know that you can have an expression switch with fall through. So this teaching thing may not have worked. So even though it was designed for ease of teaching, it is not often so taught. I once made a survey um, about, I looked at a whole bunch of blogs and said, how do they teach this? Do they really teach the two by two? Or do they first teach the most natural form, which I guess would be expression with no fall through, and then move on to the others? And that's actually what they do. And I think that's very sensible. It's best to teach what's useful. And so normally the way that people teach it, and the way that I recommend one teaches it, is that you, you start with the useful case. Expressions, no fall through. That's the case that we want people to use it in the future. And it's a beautiful statement, except maybe for the fact that they call it switch. Um, and except for the icky yield. What's the icky yield? Um, if you have a uh, statement, sorry, if you, if you can't express um, the outcome of a case with a single value, then you can put a block that does arbitrary stuff and the value that it yields is, uh, is done here with this new keyword yield. Um, there would have been better ways of doing that in my opinion, but it is what it is. So it's, some, it's complexity. Um, the old classic statements, no fall through, no, sorry, the, we're not the other yet. The, the new shiny statements with no fall through could be useful for new code, but I would suspect that in most cases you really need an expression. Um, the old one, statement and fall through, you have to read legacy code. Uh, I suppose uh, one, at some point in one's career, one needs to use it, but certainly not early on. And expression and fall through, even the Java champions were baffled why that was it. Um, so sometimes something is designed to be teachable and that design may or may not materialize itself. Um, you know, I would have been willing to admit that I'm very wrong if I had seen everyone teach it the way that it was designed, but that's not the case. So the sensible thing is to teach the useful parts. All right, moving on to what the future brings. Valhalla. So one of the things that you know that's painful to teach when you teach Java is you have an array list. It's an array list of integer because you can't have an array list of int because int is a primitive type and you can have primitive type as uh, parameters uh, of generics. You know, some blessed day, this limitation will go away and we will be able to do an array list of int. Um, from a teaching perspective, that's certainly lovely. From a performance perspective, this will be awesome because you won't have an extra level of indirection. So I can't wait for that to happen. Now, <clears throat> this is beginning to happen. So we're seeing the first JEPs appear. There's some implementation. And it seems the thinking of the, uh, of the designers is coalescing into something. I'm just telling you what it is <clears throat> so that you can kind of think about um, when that um, you might be ready for that. It'll be so seductive that you'll want to be ready for it, but it's not trivial. So what will happen is that the eight primitive uh, <clears throat> types will become basic primitive value classes. That's a mouthful. So value classes are classes in which objects have no identity. Just like 42 and 42, and you don't know whether they're the same or different. Now when you'll have, uh, like, a, and even with strings, right? They, they actually have identity, but it's kind of accidental. Uh, so now there will be uh, classes whose object, um, they, they're just compared by their contents and you can have different objects with the same content and you can't count on how they're stored. So that's a value class. You know, there's plenty of things that today would make sense as value classes, but we haven't had that. Um, all fields are final, so it's uh, kind of mutable um, compared with equal equals, and you can't lock on one of those. Um, not that you should be uh, locking on these objects in the first place. All right, so that's a value class. A primitive value class is more than that. In a primitive value class, you um, give the compiler a hint that those objects are meant to be flattened. So they can't be null because um, if something could either be null or have content, then you can't, uh, so flattening means that instead of having a reference to an object, that you just have a, a like a struct in C with all of the fields lying next to each other. So the size then could be, uh, could be larger than a reference, 
Um, but they all have the same size, and you could you know, string them one after another into an array. Um, they so they can't be null. They could potentially tear. That means that in in concurrent access, um, it, it could be possible that only a part of it is set, and then uh, the current thread gets interrupted, and then another thread sees them in an inconsistent state. That happens today for long and double. Um, the the value classes here up. They have protection against tearing, but that that is somewhat expensive, and it's not always necessary. And you can't have a recursion, so you can't have a class node that has a node next, because then you can't flatten it. Um, and so a basic primitive value class is a class that's a value class that is primitive in this very technical sense, and it's the, one of those basic eight types. So as you can see, there is some level of complexity that is involved in this and so on, to teach the pathway you know, from classes to records to value classes to primitive value classes, that there is, that's something that one does not want to do in the first course. Um, yeah, um, just a bit more background. Um, <clears throat> this idea of this value versus primitive is that the primitive objects are usually flattened, but even then they can't always be flattened. So look at this code here, where I have a 42 and I put it into a number. Well, a, a number is, uh, here I use polymorph more polymorphism, so it has to box this thing. So we still have it. Um, also, when you want to have an array list or something, because the array list is, at least today, is only one thing and it, it, it must hold references. So these primitive objects can be Kind of boxed. It's not going to be called boxed, um, but instead they're saying that if you have a primitive class, you actually have two types. You have what's called the value type, and you have the identity type. That's you know what you would call the box type, but it's not going to be called boxing because there's some characteristics of boxing that that don't carry over. So it's something new for us to learn. So the current thinking is that the reference type of int is going to be Java lang integer. So part of this, th there is a lot of complexity. So you can store, if you need nullability, then you can move to the reference type. So I could, for example, define an array of references. And again, this, this is going to be a bear to teach. Yeah, that's the new box. Um, it's all transparent. Um, I'm not going to go into the technical details here for lack of time. Um, and how is it going to work with uh, <coughs> function int, int versus int function? I don't think we have an answer to that yet. All right, so just to put this on your radar, that uh, this, uh, some of this will definitely change teaching, you know, the fact that the primitives, the, the, the barrier between primitives and classes will not be there forever um, is gonna be, make a big difference. The exact details are gonna be confusing. Um, I wanna talk a few minutes about concurrency. So um, look at, uh, a classic introduction to concurrency, the Java tutorials. Thread.start, thread.sleep, interrupted, interrupted exception, thread.join, race conditions, synchronized, volatile, deadlocks, starvation, live locks. So that's you know, the classic curriculum that teaches this stuff. Yeah, and of course, wait and notify. And so this is really so wrong if you think about it from what are people who are going through this actually going to do when they write concurrent code. I would very much hope that they would never start a thread. Yeah, they're supposed to work with thread pools. They do need to write their thread so that they can be interrupted, so that part is okay. Um, would you want them to use volatile? Um, maybe they need to understand it if they read it somewhere. But it's sprinkling synchronized and volatile is what my students try to do whenever their program doesn't work and it does no good at all. So we're teaching it in an order that makes them understand basic concepts, but that does not lead them to, to apply any of this. And like I said, what you teach first is what they're likely going to use. Um, go to Stack Overflow and you'll see plenty of attempts where people write classes, usually poorly, that's why they end up in Stack Overflow, that, that use this toolkit and nothing else. So nowadays we have Loom coming up, 
you know, Loom teaches them on how to write these virtual threads. Um, a virtual thread um, is a thread that for which blocking is really cheap. Um, you block on something and uh, then the thread gets gets parked and uh, an, another virtual thread runs on, on the, the carrier thread. The point is that blocking is something that becomes the normal case. Um, that means that you can have one virtual thread per task. So you have a, you have a, a, a threads and tasks being the same thing, it's very nice. Um, they embrace this thing called structured concurrency where um, you're encouraged to launch tasks and then make them all come together to the same point. Um, there's an API for this that's not, not really interesting. Um, um, they have a replacement for thread locals called scope locals that are also a bit too technical for here. That's why I just give a link on the slides. Um, and so um, when this comes, um, I would love to be able to teach it because what I really want to teach is, you know, you have a big problem for whatever reason is concurrent. Um, you can decompose it into individual tasks. And then you have to ask, are those tasks processor intensive or they're blocking? You know, if they ask for a database, then they're blocking. If they go to the, uh, to the internet and want to get five things, then they're blocking. Um, if they mine crypto, then they're processor intensive. But you want completely different approaches for those two. You want, in particular, virtual threads are great for blocking. Um, you use structured concurrency, it makes your program really clear. And I think that's what you want to start first. You want to teach them how to do stuff. Um, you do need to teach them uh, a little bit. You need to scare them by showing them a race condition, but you don't need to teach them right away on how to solve it with uh, synchronized or reentrant lock or volatile. Instead, teach them first how they can use thread safe data structures. Um, that takes a bit of going, uh, particularly for concurrent hash map. Um, but do that. And then do you really want to teach them synchronize and notify all? Um, yeah, maybe at the very end, um, or just use reentrant lock. Um, particular synchronize and notify all, I may want to remind you of Herb Branch Hansen's quote, where he says, it is astounding to me that Java's insecure parallelism is taken seriously. Um, and so th these, these were never great features. Um, they are what we've had for a long time until Java util concurrent. And so that's something, you know, if, if you teach this material, um, wait, I think some, some rethinking would be really good. Um, is the grass greener on the other side? You know, many universities have switched to Python and CS1. Um, and so the stated reason that I hear is they say, well, print of hello world is, that does, means that you don't have to deal with public static void main. That's bull. Um, students are perfectly uh, able to copy public static void main, not worry about it and just deal with the stuff that's inside. That is not the issue. They struggle with loops and arrays. In every CS1 course, students struggle with loops and arrays enormously. And the, the other surface things, they get over one way or another. Let's face it, there's many uh, people who use C++, of all things, C++ in a CS1 course. And they're perfectly successful, except that students struggle with loops and arrays. So that's a terrible reason. And anyway, we could just use JShell and not have public static work. Um, the reason that people love teaching with Java is that Java has great libraries, you know, uh, GUIs, web, mobile, robots, but now all the cool stuff is in Python, data science, uh, ML, that kind of stuff. And that is really, I think, what motivates this move to Python. It is, um, it is not the surface argument that print hello world is better than, uh, no. but um, it is something that's happening. And the best thing one can do to uh, stop that is to develop more fun and interesting libraries that people can use when teaching Java. Um, also, this notebook interface is kind of attractive in the beginning. And so, you know, popularizing a Java style notebook could also help. Um, and let's face it, the Python IDEs and tools are actually not that wonderful. In Java, we're blessed with a, a very rich set of tools. So I don't think one should give up on using Java for teaching. It's a great teaching language, as long as you pick a subset. Oh, and finally, in Python, the dynamic typing does increase cognitive load because students have to keep more in their mind that in Java, um, the, the IDE will remind them, namely what type every variable is and what type every function has. All right. Yeah, and it's, it's not really moving the needle. People who do this in Python don't learn programming any faster or any slower than in Java because the complexity is with loops and arrays. 
So in summary, it's no longer reasonable for beginning students to learn all of Java. It's no longer reasonable for developers to learn all of Java. All of Java has become enormously complex. And in fact, it has been so since Java 5.0 and generics at least. No one knows everything about generics except Brian Gutt. Um, for beginning students, you want to build the simplest subset possible. And everything that you can cut out of the subset is good. The simpler it is, the better. Um, less cognitive load. You can focus on the computer science and less on uh, uh, weird and often historical semantics. For entry-level programmers, you want to focus on good practice. Like I say with concurrent, don't start out with uh, uh, things that are not actually good practice, like sprinkling, synchronized, and volatile. F start out with the things that are good practice. And finally, you want to start teaching them how to learn. Java is complex. Everyone needs some part of that complexity at some point, just not when you teach it to them. So they need to teach it themselves later. Teach them how to how to deal with the JEP. Right? Have them have them read through one. They're not hard to read. Um, teach them how to use you know, good resources, high quality resources, not just Stack Overflow, but you know, Java Almanac, inside Java, Fuji. And that, th those three things, I think, are kind of my takeaway. And the fourth takeaway that I should have written on the slide is consciously think about, you know, what do you want to teach? Don't just do what everyone has done all the time. Java is changing. It's now changing dramatically. And those changes should reflect your teaching and your learning. So that gets me to exactly 60 minutes, um, but we have an infinite amount of time for questions. So um, I'll be sticking around for anyone who has questions or anyone who says this was So we've stupid. got a whole bunch here. Would you like me to start reading some of them Absolutely. to you? Or do you see? Yeah. OK, yeah. Um, what about um, teaching first about the primitive types and then advancing to classes? Well, you kind of have to do that because you, uh, in order to do anything with classes, you need variables. And so it's, a, um, I mean, so you have to start with numbers and strings. Um, you know, I like to toss in strings as early as possible because at least strings are objects you can call methods on. Okay. Um, to what extent do you uh, lean on JShell in the beginning? Um, so actually, the, my favorite way of starting out is not with JShell, but with BlueJ. Um, um, so for those who don't know, BlueJ is this marvelous little environment where you can um, instantiate objects um, on, a, on a workbench. And um, so you can make objects without ever having to write a, a line of code. You click your way through, and there is an object. Then you click on it, and you can uh, call any of its methods and see the results. And then you can also open a window that looks just like BlueJ, uh, not, not, not just like JShell, and where you can then type the commands um, in, in Java. Uh, with the Java syntax. And by seeing those two next to each other, students have an intuitive idea what an object is. An object is a blob that can do certain things and what the Java syntax for that is. And so then I actually don't use JShell for the first four weeks. After about four weeks, uh, BlueJ has served its purpose and then it makes sense to use uh, some other ID in JShell. Are there uh, other references that you can... Um recommend on learning how to teach programming? I wish th th I, I could give like a handbook of it, uh, but there isn't. I mean, it's a, uh, it's, it's a vibrant field. There are conferences about it um, and a lot of controversy, but I don't really know of, of one book that I could say how to teach. Um, yeah, and the ones that I know are kind of collections to to the to the research literature, but it's not distilled down to where you could just use it as a handbook. Where do you fall on the objects first argument? Um, I personally teach objects first for a completely dumb reason, and that is that I always teach classes that have a mixture of students who have already learned how to program, maybe in high school, maybe at a summer course, and students who've never programmed before. And by doing objects first, it kind of puts them on a more equal playing field, that the ones who know no programming are less intimidated because the students already know how to write uh, loops. They, they also don't know how to do objects. Um, but that's kind of a very tactical reason. Um, pragmatically, I think in the end, the difference is not so large because the object late crowd doesn't teach objects that late. They teach, teach objects in week eight instead of in week three. 
and you know it's so uh, it's not not a huge difference um i do like the fact that with objects early you don't have a lot of static methods you know, whereas with objects late you end up going through that chapter where everything is a static method and then that's something that they actively have to unlearn but it's as long as the objects come soon enough it's not so bad what i would not like is to have no objects at all in cs1 right and traditionally that's the way our python courses are done here there are no objects in the python course but as soon as they hit, hit java they start yeah. seeing objects yeah. at least by week four week five yeah. something like that yeah. And that might work because students perceive them as two different tools. And uh, so if they see Java from the get-go with objects, that might be fun. Yeah, I guess whenever I've tried objects first, I've always found that there isn't enough for them to do with the objects. Ah, so, um, so, so what I do is I give them a couple of interesting classes that are not in the standard library. So one of them is, is a class that does... Uh, calendar days. Um, and so then, uh, then I asked, asked them to compute how many days they've been alive. And so they see that as a non-trivial enough example. And what, there's a few other exercises. The other one is a picture class where they can draw. And with those two, they see enough objects that are interesting. And yet, it seems to be what you said about loops and arrays. That's a big stumbling block. That's just an enormous problem for most students. Yeah. Objects are not. Um, no. The ones I, the, I, in I my agree. in my experience, the ones who are capable, capable. The ones some of the ones who stick with it will eventually get objects. But loops and arrays are just an incredible hurdle yes. for many of our students. Do you have any advice? Well, really, my the, the one advice that I can offer is to actively teach these patterns. I think these loop patterns make a big difference. If you tell them, here are like the 10 things that happen most of the time, um, it gives them s some grounding. Um, so that's the only kind of innovation. I mean, they, the traditional thing is that you have this problem solving um, where you kind of generally teach them how do you decompose a problem, but that's abstract and it's hard for them to follow. Right. Um, the only other thing that I, I actively do um, and it's it's very hard, is I try to get them to make a sketch, anything, on paper before they start with anything, or to play it out with like Lego blocks or coins or something um, so that they even understand what it is that they're doing. So my favorite anecdote is one time um, my lab assistant was sick and I had to do the labs, and the, the, assign the lab assignment was to swap the, fir the, the first and the second half of an array. And so students were working in groups. After 10 minutes of discussions, I looked at what all of the groups had concluded on how to do it. Um, almost all of the groups, except one, uh, one uh, that, that uh, made good progress, had only agreed on one thing, namely that they needed to use a for loop. And that's all. They didn't know what the for loop was supposed to do. Um, and so I then uh, lined up a bunch of coins in front of them and said, do it, swap them the way that you have just discussed. And they had never gotten to that. Mm. Because in the book, it says there's a for loop, there's a while loop, there's a do loop. That's kind of all the guidance that the book gave them. And so that's, um, and now I put something in the book that says, play it out with physical objects. That's a good idea. Um, do you have a reference where these um, loop patterns are? Um, big Java. Big Java, okay, yeah, good. And there's a there's, there's a Python version as well. What about what about uh, languages like Scratch? Um, you know, I'm all for Scratch for for beginners. And Scratch doesn't really get you very far, right? Because uh, uh, I mean, you can do you can do functions, and that's kind of where it stops. Um, if you, um, but yeah, I mean, I I think. Um, so whenever I've done it, like as an enrichment activity, um, I found that it was very good for like a couple of weeks. And then people, people kind of got tired of the blocking. So if, if there is an environment where you can switch back and forth between blocks and syntax, that would be better. So there's some JavaScript versions of it that, that work like that. Good. Um, 
Bill says, uh, confused, loops and arrays. My students don't have any problems with that. Whoa, something's happening here with my, um, quiet, well, quiet, you. Uh, I've got to silence my Alexa device. Well, um, Maybe by unplugging it. There we go. That works. Yeah. Uh, Bill says, I'm confused, loops and arrays. My students don't have any problems with that. By week well, six, they've implemented my array list. Uh, that's a completely different thing. Um, okay. they, can implement, they can implement the array list, but can they swap the first and the second half of an array? Can they uh -huh. swap the maximum and the minimum? Those are very different skills. Do you find that some categories of students are better at learning these concepts than others? For instance, different majors, people with major in this and major in that. Um, I, I mean, the thing that to, to me influences more than anything is the attitude of the student. Now, are they willing to be frustrated? Um, that you know, if someone is used to you know, learning what the one right procedure is and following the procedure, that's that's hard in, in CS. Um, and so the ones who are you know, willing to have just the right mixture between tinkering and understanding concepts, um, that tends to be good. But that's teachable. So mm -hmm. I I actively teach uh dealing with frustration because uh i mean i see a lot of people and the uh, it and, and it's there's a uh, that's why computer uh, well, computer science is so difficult that you start out with a really hard subject right when someone learns biology 101 in their first course they have to memorize a whole bunch of uh, terminology but the concepts are not yet that difficult but we start out with the hardest stuff you know we say you should be able to write a reasonable project at the end of the semester yeah, well, I, I would argue that it's, it's teachable to some extent. It you can you can you can talk about dealing with the frustration. There are some students who just won't hear well, that. And there's won't. always, of course, yeah. some students who won't. That's that's a universal truth. I'm sure even in biology, that's the case. Yeah. Um, and, so and, I'm, and, I'm not saying that I have the recipe to teach every student, but I think that it is helpful to address the fact that right. it's frustrating. And, and, and then I would go one step further and say it's not just the ability to deal with frustration, it's the love of that dealing with frustration and overcoming it that makes a really yeah. good student. Well, that may be so, but that doesn't... <clears throat> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested in teaching the average student. And so if I say, well, you must overcome this... Um, you know, I'm settling for you must just you know just you know, try to deal with it, right? Because uh, yeah, the, the very best students, of course, you know they they uh, can do well with this, and they also motivate and interested in things. But uh, to me, uh, sure, not every student is going to be ready for the class, and there's nothing we can do about that. But I'd like to help the ones who are ready for the class, but who are just so challenged by. It. Okay. Uh, Bill says, uh, I use TDD. I write the tests for my students and they fill in the code that passes. That way they start with running code. How do you deal with that? Um, that could be good. Um, I mean, I, uh, there are some uh, people who have the expectation that students should start with a blank screen and produce everything. I almost never do that. I almost always start them out with something where 90% is pre-written. Um, and you could do that with TDD or you could not do that with TDD. Like I always give them public static void main, for example. There's no, nothing to be gained for them to, uh, to, to even touch it. Um, and so um, I guess because I use an autograder uh, in the beginning class, uh, I mean, they'll do you know, a couple hundred autograder problems. Um, they have implicit test cases, but I don't teach... Uh, uh, a uh, like J unit. I could. Do, you, do you want to mention the autograder that you use, by the way? Yeah, yeah, it's called Code Check. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you. I mean, our, our discussions all summer about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, in, you know, I've, certainly, if uh, TDD can work. Okay, and now I have to end this session because I have to go and teach. I need right. to be downstairs in 10 minutes and going and telling them about all this good stuff. Okay, what are you teaching? Uh, it's discrete math, but uh, okay. uh, still good okay. stuff. Still good stuff. <laughs> Java next semester. All right. Very good.
Well, thanks, hey, Kai, everyone. Thank you so much for, for uh, doing this. It was really informative. I enjoyed hearing about it. I liked seeing people's questions. And wow, great. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check out the, the um, replay of this uh, to catch all these ideas again. They're really okay. fantastic. And everybody, thank you for coming. Um, enjoy the rest of the J Champions Conference. Have a good day. Have a good week. Have a good evening wherever you are in the world. We'll see you soon. All right. Bye-bye.